Welcome to Capital Class. I'm Adam Geary. We founded Capital Class to share candid conversations with market-leading businesses while humanizing the journey of constructing an enterprise. In our first episode, we went into the business of education. We've grown accustomed to America's household education brands as a cornerstone of our education system. However, at one point, they started out as a simple idea. How does an education company come to exist? What separates great ideas from great companies? And what are the future trends of the education market, especially in the COVID classroom environment? It's almost hard to imagine how a company can grow from idea to enterprise. We decided to explore this topic and sought out a market leader in the development of education businesses. As our first episode, I had the pleasure to sit down with Ash Kaluarachi from StarDed to help us understand the life cycle of an education company in America's education system. We pose these questions and many more in today's episode of Capital Class. We hope you enjoy. Ash, welcome to the show. Adam, good to be here. Ash, on a personal note, I joined your uh, StarDed mentorship board and I'll compliment you that not only was I extremely impressed with StarDed, but your personal uh, understanding and awareness of the edtech market was second to few, if maybe second to none. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And I probably take pride in knowing the people who know what's going on. I rarely know what's going on. (laughs) Ash, I think the business of education is a bit of a mystery for many. I think if you look, um, the ventures that begin either either organically or with venture funding or private equity funding, then become successful. And really that entire marketplace for, for most people is a bit of a Rubik's Cube. What can you tell us about the ed tech space in general? And, and how did you get started? Why don't I start with that, that second question first? My journey really began in the space when um, I was an early employee at an accelerator called Techstars. Uh, For those of you who might not be aware of of what the concept of Accelerator is, it's essentially a program that allows startups to receive funding, get access to capital and mentorship. And uh, across uh, a certain time period, they end up growing their organizations or better better yet, uh, refining how they describe and position their organizations for success. Uh, These programs usually end with a, a demo day of sorts where they present the results of, of the program and, and what they've achieved. Uh, the program that I was part of was uh, essentially the first ed tech program that Techstars uh, built. Uh, that was the Kaplan Ed Tech Accelerator. Uh, to this day, it remains the most successful ed tech program in history if you measure success by financial outcome. Uh, I went on to build a couple of accelerators for Intel, the large tech company, as well as New York University. And uh, having invested in about 100 ed tech companies through those programs, uh, didn't feel like we were impacting the space at the scale we were hoping to, and, and launched StartEd to try to do that a little bit more effectively. So that's, that's how I got started in the space. Uh, I can go into a little bit more detail about the environment that I did in as well, Adam. Yeah, I I think what would be helpful for folks to know is what's the success rate of ed tech companies? Like how many companies do we not know about? What the market as I've seen it, especially spending time together with you, is really interesting and and fragmented though. So tell take us a little bit about the experience of an ed tech company. Certainly. My perspective on on the space is really that there's three or four different entry points into the space as as an innovator. Um, And don't get me wrong, everybody in the space, this complex ecosystem of investors, uh, entrepreneurs, educators, policymakers, researchers, students, parents, and the organizations around them, all of them can be innovators. Uh, They just need to be aware of what problems really need solving. I think if you were to just specifically look at that innovator subset, the the profile of of those individuals tends to be uh, either that 
they experienced um, a, a challenge in their own educational experience, uh, whether it was because of where they came from or who they were, or because uh, they experienced the inefficiencies of the current education system and decided, I want to try to fix it. Um, I've also seen people start um, a company because they experienced the inefficiency of being in the K-12 class- classroom or the higher ed classroom in in the space. So you can co- convert from being a classroom educator to an innovator. And I find those solutions tend to care a lot about whether the product actually works. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I see uh, a group of innovators now, you know, uh, 15, 20 years into the, the, the ecosystem being relatively mature, starting to enter the space after having built an ed tech company, uh, a non-ed tech company, uh, so having exited organization in, in a peripheral space or a separate space, uh, wanting to create a little bit more impact and then launching an education-oriented solution. Those folks know how to build a company. They just might not know how to do so in the education space. So that's where the innovator te- tends to come from. Mm. Where they go is a, is a separate matter. Um, the in order to understand the tech space in general, you need to define what education is. And my definition of education are these five different verticals, which if you talk about in the sequence of us experiencing them as as we all do, we go through early childhood, we go through K-12, we go through higher ed, uh, those who are lucky to do so, we experience learning in the workforce and then we all become adult, lifelong learners. Those five verticals tend to uh, correspond to five different industries, each of which has its own nuances, dynamics, and growth potential. Very interesting. Do you find yourself surprised at times which companies make it and which companies don't? Uh, I, I've gotten to the point where it's it's relatively hard to surprise me in that I tend to little be a little bit more of a cynic, unfortunately. So I don't expect <laughs> that. So I, I guess I, I I leave room to be pleasantly surprised all the time. Uh, I think there's uh, a nuance around company building that people don't necessarily focus on, where they tend to focus on the product quite a bit. But in my experience, the product is the least important aspect of building a company. What's more important are uh, the people who are doing so. You know, do they have the relative experience? Do they make sense as a combination uh, of, of skill sets? Uh, have they shown passion in solving a particular problem? The second is, are they aware of the, the problem that needs to be solved? Is the problem big enough? Is the problem the world needs solved? Uh, then and then, thirdly, is there evidence of their ability to do so? Right, and in 2020, you can gather evidence about your team's ability to solve a problem even before you create a fully fledged product. So, so people, problem, and then I, let's call it progress tend to be the three P's that are even more important than the product P, in my opinion. Very interesting. We talk often about nice to have versus need to have. It's just somewhat of a summary around there's a lot in the space in the nice to have really interesting ideas tools to help make school bus lines simplified and uh, all all the maybe irritant points that are in education but the actual real core um, it's really hard to find need to haves but when you do and when they are truly dynamic those those tend to be the companies that take off the curriculum associates of the world etc mm-hmm. do you think with the SoftBank, WeWork scenario, and the Uber investment situation, have investors come back down to reality about evaluating these companies on their fundamentals of good business, good leadership, and the potential for growth more so than maybe the hype that we were seeing in previous years? Well, don't get me started on venture capital. <laughs> uh, as, as, a, as a venture capitalist myself, I encourage founders not to explore venture capital as their only option if you're building an education company, mostly because venture capital A, if they're doing their job right, they get it right one in 10 times because Mm -hmm. they only need to be right one in 10 times to return their fund. That's usually how the math works, right? And 
uh, as an edtech founder, you would be doing yourself a disservice if you were to be seeking you know, venture capital dilutive investment straight out the gate. Uh, TechCrunch uh, and and the stories and the, and the platforms that tell the story of the SoftBank's WeWorks of the world and Ubers of the world tend to portray venture capital as the only option to grow your company when in edtech, there are far more interesting and founder friendly ways to get started. You may eventually need venture capital to really scale, but um, you shouldn't be starting out with that. Um, my company started, there's a lot of work training entrepreneurs on the availability of different things. Uh, so there's you know grants, there's um, you know crowdsourcing, there's um, uh, different types of competitions, there's different ways to get your company off the ground before you really dive into venture capital, before you're actually ready for it. Uh, that said, money isn't necessarily the, the, the thing you need as well all the time. So often it's the time and effort and insight of experienced individuals in the space, i.e. mentors, uh, such as yourself, Adam. Thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time to be a mentor at StartEd. Um, that is probably more valuable for those three profiles of EdTech founders that I discussed out the gate than uh, than money is because you don't know where to actually put those dollars to generate the best ROI. Do you see an industry where ed tech companies, or we'll just call them companies in general, are perpetually raising and that that almost becomes their business. The business of the company is to raise money and to live off different different series and the, that perpetual state. Have, have you noticed that trend? It, it's, it's a fact of life. Uh, if, you're, if you start fundraising and you bring in outside dollars, then that's the CEO's job until they exit. Uh, and it, it's a full-time job that takes all of their time whenever they're fundraising, which usually is about three to six months. Uh, and they're stuck in that perpetual cycle until there's an outcome, until the company fails or exits. So uh, so again, another reason uh, uh, to be informed about walking down that path, it is a feasible path to walk down, but it's not the only path. Uh, and it's it's one that uh, usually results in in being taken away from doing what you love as a founder, which is solving problems and building companies. Uh, and that tends to be the irony of it. Now, I've seen plenty of companies in EdTech uh, build an organization, bootstrap it to a few million dollars in revenue, and then uh, the company becomes a, a, a tuck-in acquisition uh, to, uh, for a private equity firm, uh, uh, it's rare that a company in edtech will IPO. Again, these are the stories that the press tells. Uh, so we think it's the norm, but it's not. It's actually the exception to the rule. There are far more companies that that uh, uh, founder bootstraps, maintains large ownership of the organization, and then exits for a relatively small number, but they keep most of that money. Right? And, and that's a great financial outcome for the individual. Uh, and in, in 2020, the world, the way is currently built, that, that private equity target acquisition uh, outcome is far more likely for a company. Fascinating. A key piece of Stratius's work is advising district leaders. And when we speak with those, you know, think the CAOs or the, the superintendents, district soups, I think the biggest challenge, and I, I would challenge, I would say that if you're a district soup, you've probably seen more pitch decks, more proposals than a private equity fund. Very likely. And, and it's the, it's so hard to differentiate between what's real and what's vapor, what can actually move the needle, and what is just a really fantastic salesperson. So if you were advising a district leader, what would you tell them about how to evaluate partnering with an ed tech organization? Not to talk to the salesperson. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, I say that uh, for a little facetiously, but it, there's, there's truth in that. Um, the problem with the current ecosystem is that there's so many point solutions and therefore so many sales, salespeople associated with each point solution that the onus of responsibility for, for choosing what should work and what, what does not has shifted to those who are wholly unequipped to do so, which is the district leader. And it's not because they're incapable of doing so. It's because they haven't been given the tools, nor the know-how, nor the time 
uh, to pass through all these various options. So the problem needs to be solved in two places. One, uh, uh, on the industry side, uh, founders need to be educated about which district leaders and, and which schools need to be approached and how they should be approached. Um, they should be doing that homework uh, without allowing the, the, the district leader to, uh, to do so. So that's, that's probably the first signal. If a founder hasn't done the homework to make sure that this is a solution uh, that this school is or this district is experiencing, I wouldn't take the call. Right. Uh, so I'm shifting that responsibility back to the founder uh, for doing their homework. The, the second is uh, um, you should be looking for signals, right? So uh, not every solution is built the same, not every team is built the same. Uh, usually it's not the, the, the product that has the best efficacy that tends to win in this space. It's the, it's the, it's the solution that has the sa- best salespeople. So I would almost uh, look at a, a, at a compelling salesperson and look beyond them to the founder and the product and the signals that you would look for relate to uh, have they actually received uh, uh, mentorship and guidance from senior folks in the industry, such as yourselves. Uh, I would look at um, uh, uh, signals like have they gone through uh, certain accelerator programs uh, that that uh, support creating effective solutions? Uh, have they received grant funding from foundations that care about the the solution actually working or not have they run random control controlled trials to prove that their solution works do they have that evidence it's really easy to gather that evidence in in 2020 you can spend three to six months if you care about solutions that actually work and prove that your solution does i i but my in my experience about 10 percent of founders actually spend the time doing that i'd say if you want to save your time uh, look for that. Absolutely. For some of the most truest statements about startup evaluation uh, that that I've heard. I mean, companies should be doing their homework on the district, and conversely, they should district should be asking the hard questions around: Do you have efficacy, and do you have a track record of working with high quality organizations that would deem you viable? It's Ash, amazing. Absolutely. Let me let me bring take you out on this. We're in a moment of ed tech resurgence. I would tell you that we are seeing an increasing number of call volume requests for our time and, and more and more so from investors trying to find what's what's next. So what are the big trends that you're seeing in the marketplace? If you had to make some bold predictions, 2020, 2021, what do you see coming about? Ah, uh, let, let me look into my crystal ball here for a second. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the, I want to hone in on one statement that you made around those investors that are that are approaching you, Adam. In in my experience, there are also two different kinds of investors, and let's assume that these are venture capital investors uh, and private equity folks. There are the folks who have been doing the work in education for all this time, you know, you know, the, for the past 15, 20 years. And then there are the folks who have been recently alerted to the fact that distance learning and edtech is going to be a big thing because the world is in the, the largest user test of education technology in the history of mankind. Right? Uh, I think the latest number was almost 2 billion users suddenly popped up on everybody's radar. The, the distinction between uh, those two in types of investors is, is simply this. The folks who have been investing in the space for all this time uh, are the people who tend to be able to understand which organizations are going to be successful and have efficacy. The folks who are approaching the space newly don't tend to be lead investors. Uh, they tend to be follow in, follow on investors or, or followers in, in, in my vernacular who follow the lead of a lead investor. So as a as a founder, uh, my recommendation is still look for those lead investors who have been showing dotted line investment in the space. Look for uh, uh, those folks, uh, filter for those folks, and you will save a lot of time in in working through the noise of people who are approaching the space uh, over the last uh, year or so. the The second uh, question you asked is really around around prediction. So let me 
set the stage a little bit if you if you don't if you don't mind uh, uh, please and, and i hope the crystal ball is clear cuz i'm interested <laughs> well it's more like a assumptions ball than a crystal ball but Fair. Uh, my my set of assumptions here are the following one that that a that a vaccine vaccine is you know 6 to 12 months out at the very at the very least and even when we do have one that fear will still continue to prevail for those who are healthy and certainly for those who uh, are uh, immunosuppressed. And we won't be going back to what we all experienced leading up to this year. Uh, that's an unpopular viewpoint, uh, but I, I believe that is an assumption that you would need to make if you're a realist. Uh, some portion of the people that experienced uh, education technology solutions, working online, learning online, will continue to do so, right? Again, we, we are in the largest user test in, in, in the history of mankind. And some proportion of those, because solutions are relatively decent today, will continue to do so uh, you know, once we go back to uh, some semblance of normal. Some people would have a bad experience and, and would not. Um, I suspect that that first group is going to be larger than the second group. That's my mm. second one, right? Um, the, the third, the third assumption, and, and this is where, uh, I, I probably end up insulting some people is that, um, the role that schools need to play, uh, will change as well. Uh, the, there are some schools that, that will, uh, suffer during that, this time, there will be a lot of people that will need to change their roles but in in most of my my experience, what I've seen happening in these types of situations is that um, uh, the the incumbents, the people who are are providing learning solutions, uh, need to change um, what their services are because the needs of their customer has changed, right? And and if all of us aren't behaving entrepreneurially uh, in 2020 and assuming things that will go back to normal our endeavors will fail uh, because the world has changed in that our customer needs have changed. So those are the three basic assumptions uh, that I'm making, Adam. Am I, am I heading in the right direction? Absolutely. I, I think the institutions themselves will certainly no longer look the way they had. And I think that's, an, that's a fair assumption. Um, I, I wonder about that personally, and I think your, your advice is sage. Ash, so ba- based on those those assumptions, Adam, then then there are some predictions that that can lend themselves out of that uh, out of that. So um, my 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 take is that a lot of um, uh, schools will need to create um, uh, distance learning options, more nuanced uh, 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 configurations of their real estate. Uh, in order to serve the needs of their customers, right? Um, and I think that I've seen interesting solutions ranging from, you know, distance teaching, so where where educators actually teach from home and and the physical buildings are more in line with um, kind of wellness and learning centers for those who need it, for those who need a meal, those who need that safety, those who need that that shelter, um, all the way to uh, new combinations of of um, you know scheduling and and hybrid learning. I think higher ed is probably the most uh, the, the space that will shift the most. Um, uh, the 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 transition from K twelve to higher ed uh, will also change. People will be taking you know gap years, and parents will be guiding a lot of what what people do post K twelve. Uh, and I think that uh, the the parent ha- is is a good signal of what solutions will will succeed because parental sentiment will drive uh, how successful a given school will be as well as what type of um, uh, you know learning or, or, or homeschooling or alternative learning programs students end up taking in that transition between k-12 and higher ed um, and um, you know uh, the the higher ed institutions will most likely shift in some way uh, I think that more schools that have a great brand name wouldn't won't have to change significantly, but uh, the schools that that rely on um, uh, on on other things uh, that isn't associated with brand, i.e., uh, they provide 
access to experts, high quality content, uh, and kind of that social aspect of learning, um, they'll need to re- realign themselves on what value proposition they're providing students. And I suspect that if they don't create, um, if they don't really lean into ho- what, what aspect of those you know, three or four features they do really well and differentiate themselves, they will see uh, students and learners going to other options. So that those are uh, some some somewhat depressing uh, predictions of mine. Depressing or bold, depend how you ask. <laughs> Ash, thank you so much for joining us. This has been extremely valuable, and and I for one, both as you know, the leader of our company, but an investor, find these these things enlightening and insightful. So, Ash, if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, I'm usually very responsive on LinkedIn uh, if people find me on there. Um, I would encourage um, uh, reaching out to my team at started.com uh, if anyone has questions about you know, how we uh, connect companies with, with investors and mentors, how we help people find jobs in, in their tech space. Uh, and and how we can build a little bit of uh, brand awareness around um, a given organization. Uh, I also encourage uh, people who want to give back, uh, who are senior investors, educators, and entrepreneurs who are listening, uh, to to reach out to me as well. Uh, uh, my my email address is ash at startedaccelerator dot com if anyone wants to get in touch. Great, Ash Kaluarachi, managing director of Started. Thank you so much for joining us on Capital Class. Thank you, Adam. We hope you enjoyed our first class with Ash Kaluarachi. If you'd like to learn more about our guest, Ash, and StartEd, please visit startEd.com. That's S-T-A-R-T dash E-D dot com. And if you have an idea for our next class, please email me directly at adam.geary at gmail.com. You've been listening to Capital Class, a venture with the Stratagus Podcast Network. I'm Adam Geary. Class is closed.